It's Tuesday afternoon, 4 p.m. in Switzerland, and it's Space Coffee Web Talk time. Our Space Coffee Web Talk, 33 minutes with Elina Morozova, will begin soon. Thanks for joining us for our talk today about space and IGOs, where IGOs are intergovernmental organizations, on the 50th anniversary of Intersputnik. As always, we appreciate your participation and ongoing feedback that is valuable for us and helps us to improve. I'm Thorsten Kreening, your host today and publisher of Spacewatch.global. We are a Switzerland-based online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. I know many of you are already familiar with our websites, our bi-weekly and daily newsletters and the Space Cafe podcasts. Our new episode number 20 was released last week, features the super cool Alexander Suchek um, with the title Ether and the Legal Challenges of Space. We also keep our fan shop open online for you to support us actively and become a space watcher. Edition one has cool items for you and your friends and the ones you love. And hey, it's Valentine's Day around the corner. So your support is needed to keep our work alive for you. If you've missed any of our previous web talks, we have an archive available on our web page in the events section and on YouTube. We host our Space Cafe web talks live weekly. This Space Cafe is already the 44th edition today. Now, I'm super excited to have her on my show today. With that, a very warm welcome, Elena Morozova. So, and just a few words about you, and then we kick off our dialogue. Elena is the just promoted executive director of the Intersputnik International Organization of Space Communication and working in the organization for more than 15 years. And yes, you're right. For 15 years, that means she started as direct after school. She graduated with honors from the Department of International Law of the Russian Foreign Trade Academy under the Ministry of Economic Development and Trade of the Russian Federation. Elena has a master degree in international business law from the University of Manchester and that in the cum laude edition, of course. Apart from working for Intersputnik, Elena is engaged in extensive research, having authored and teaching a course in international space law and telecommunication law within the scope of a master's program in international public law at the St. Petersburg State University. Elena sits also on the board of directors of the International Institute of Space Law, the ISIL. She is the author of about 40 publications in English and Russian dedicated to space telecommunication and various aspects of space activities. Gosh, almost done with that. So once more, welcome Elena to the show. Hello, Torsten. Hello, everybody in the room. It is such a pleasure to be with you today. And thank you very much for such a warm welcome and for this compliment to my age. Of course, I started in Tersputnik just in school. Of course, of course. So tell us a bit um, about Intersputnik. What is the purpose of its establishment? Um, because we see a 50 here also in the slides still in. So and uh, I think we will hear about it. Uh, indeed, as you can see on this slide, we are celebrating 50th anniversary this year. So this organization was established in 1971. And uh, with a very little exaggeration, I can say that uh, Interest Putnik is to some extent a Cold War baby. It was established as a response uh, to the establishment of Intelsat by the United States of America. And uh, that time, um, uh, Soviet states, Soviet nations had to make their decision whether to join an Intelsat uh, system on the Intelsat conditions or to establish something uh, separate. And the decision was taken by uh, nine states to establish Intersputnik. So it was intended to be a global uh, satellite system to communicate uh, Soviet bloc states. Uh, now, of course, we have more states. We have 26 states, not nine, as uh, we had in 1971. 
For the whole history of Intrasputnik, um, we have been using um, uh, satellites which were provided firstly by the Soviet Union. Now we heavily rely on Russian satellites. And what is interesting, and maybe uh, the name of our organization can be a bit misleading, Intersputnik have never has uh, its own satellites. So it has always been operating as a system of systems. So it means that we could provide satellite capacity of uh, different satellite operators and spacefaring nations which are members of Intersputnik. For instance, today we have about one third of our member states who really have their national satellite systems. And uh, since the very beginning, uh, Intrasputnik was headquartered in Moscow, uh, Soviet Union or Russia today. And this, of course, um, uh, has a, a very strong impact on our activity. Uh, the initiative itself was led by the Soviet Union. And uh, as a practical example, all four directors general of Intrasputnik are uh, Soviet or Russian. And of course, uh, the bulk majority of our staff members, some 90% uh, are Russians. So, uh, of course, that's not uh, all what we do for our member states. Uh, we had uh, some uh, contributions to the establishment of their national uh, satellite systems, uh, not only uh, satellites themselves, but certain ground infrastructure. For instance, we had uh, projects at the very uh, beginning of the Intrasputnik history for Cuba, for Mongolia, for some other states. So it's uh, a brief uh, purpose of Intrasputnik. Okay, I see, I see. Interesting. So, hey, I can say that I'm a Cold War baby as well. So, uh, at least from, from my age. So, which, which other member states are besides the ex Soviet Union empire states are are in and, and which are the most active ones? Uh, we usually say that Intrasputnik is a truly unique organization because it um, have uh, members from all the continents. So, for instance, we have Nicaragua from Central America, uh, we have Somalia uh, from uh, Africa, and um, the European uh, countries play a vital role in Intrasputnik since the very beginning of our history. For instance, uh, more than half of those states who uh, established Intrasputnik were European countries. Um, uh, like Hungary, Poland, Bulgaria, Germany, and Romania. And uh, the level of participation of different states in Intrasputnik varies uh, throughout our history. It uh, heavily depends on uh, the situation in the state and what priorities this state has at this current moment. Uh, just as an example, um, later this week, on Friday, uh, we will commemorate 30th anniversary of Syria being a member of Intrasputnik. And uh, for very uh, clear reason, this state has currently different priorities. But it used to be a very active member of Intrasputnik. Just uh, one example, in 1999, it was under the chairmanship of Syria, uh, when the board, uh, the highest Intersputnik body, made a decision that uh, our organization should accept rights and obligations under the uh, registration convention. Uh, so the level of participation can vary, but uh, states usually participate quite actively in our activity. Okay. Yeah, it seems to be a very political agenda or in an in Intersputnik without any doubt. and our, I mean, I've also seen that, that North Korea is uh, on, on, on your member state list. And uh, I mean, yeah, again, it's as political as it can go. I'm, I'm also, and you mentioned it earlier, I mean, with the reunification of Germany, I think the hangover from us in the East, which obviously were a member, um, seems to be now the only Western member. And maybe can you elaborate a bit on, on, on the role, what that means. And to continue on that, are you looking also for other members in the Western states? 
Uh, yes, uh, we do. For instance, uh, several years ago, we started negotiations with France about uh, France's uh, acceding to interest scrutiny. Mm -hmm. And um, it is almost a settled uh, matter for now. And we are expecting to welcome France at the 27th member state of interest scrutiny later this year. And uh, I believe that Utilsat SA, uh, French uh, satellite operator, is going to be uh, the signatory of Intersputnik for France. It means that our uh, practical cooperation can enhance. Uh, but uh, going back to uh, Germany, I must say that uh, Germany has a very special treatment in our organization. Uh, of course, all members are equal, but you know there is always something connected to this history. Um, in the 90s, uh, when the Soviet Union was uh, going to split, and uh, there was another process in Germany, I mean uh, Eastern Germany and the newly established state, Germany was the first uh, which declared that it was going to be a legal successor for the East Germany. And it was a kind of a signal to other member states that the organization that Intersputnik must survive, must continue uh, its uh, space activity. And the uh, Soviet Union was the next one. Uh, it also declared that it was going to continue the membership, I mean, Russia, to continue the membership of Soviet Union. So I would say that we all remember uh, who uh, in, in person, uh, who just uh, heard this story that Germany was uh, the state which made Intersputnik to stay alive. Interesting. Happy to, and happy to hear that. Uh, I mean, also that we got special treatment. So, uh, it, this is not, <laughs> of course, the, the only thing about Germany. Uh, Germany is represented by the Federal Ministry right. of Economic Affairs and um, uh, energy and uh, for instance we have a german representative on the audit committee and uh, germany participates in the board meetings and other meetings of interest okay so let's do a fast forward to today so what is the status today so i, I mean you mentioned that france is about to join later this year so where are you today or the status today and what that does Intersputnik do for its members? Uh, we can be described as a quite typical intergovernmental telecommunication satellite organization. I'm sure our uh, audience know uh, the other examples, for instance, International Telecommunication Satellite Organization, um, Utilstat, IGO, uh, International Mobile Satellite Organizations, uh, organization. We are the so-called uh, telecommunication satellite organization. So this is the current status. And uh, in contrast to those organizations, uh, which went through the so-called privatization. Uh, of course, uh, IGOs cannot be privatized by the processes referred to as like that. Uh, I mean that uh, for private businesses, we have Intelsat and we have International Telecommunication Satellite Organization, which supervises this activity. We have this same story with Inmarsat and Utilsat. And uh, Intersputnik decided not to uh, go on uh, the same path, but of course we went through a huge reorganization in 90s. And for uh, doing commercial business, uh, a new level of participation was implemented in Intersputnik and uh, a new body was established, so-called operations committee and uh, uh, the institution of the so-called signatories. It was made uh, for the purpose to um, make into Sputnik engaged in commercial activity. And it is something uh, unique about interest Sputnik. We are uh, entitled by our uh, documents to run the commercial activities. So we have two heads now, like international 
organization and a satellite operator. Mm -hmm. And in our capacity as a typical IGO, uh, we have a permanent observer status at the UN Committee on Peaceful Uses of Ultra Space. Uh, I have mentioned the registration convention, but actually in 2018, Sputnik acceded to uh, three UN space treaties and um, uh, was also the first organization which uh, accepted responsibility uh, to, for compliance with the outer space treaty. So this is on the international level. Of course, we also participate in uh, the activity of International Telecommunication Union. As a group of state, uh, because IGO is a clearly a group of state, we have uh, the right to file frequencies uh, in uh, orbit and to utilize uh, these frequencies and satellite networks for our own projects and projects which are implemented with our partners. And uh, in our capacity as a satellite uh, operator, we do typical operators business like leasing and reselling satellite capacity by providing access to um, not only our member states, but to any uh, interested customer. And once again, I would like to emphasize that it is something which is prescribed in our statutory documents as one of the aims uh, of our activity. Uh, for turnkey solutions, we have uh, established a subsidiary a Russian uh, company named uh, Isatel LLC. If we need a kind of a ground infrastructure for our project, we just uh, uh, call in uh, Isatel and can mm -hmm. suggest some solutions, uh, like uh, turnkey solutions. So that's basically these two major uh, functions that we have now. There's an interesting question from from Franco or coming coming in, which I will take in a, in a second. But let's start. But we how can we lead up to that? So, what is the kind of development or support that Intersputnik gives to, let's call it the, the low developed countries? I don't want to say these are third world countries, but I mean at the moment you you mentioned or I mean Syria is a good example. Was a flourishing state is now under the conditions of war for, for many years. So, and or, I mean, but there, there are others also, I mean, Somalia is not in the best shape or of a state, I would say, and or Nicaragua, you mentioned. So how do you engage with them on or, on, or support them? As the best example which came to my mind is related not to our member state, but let's call them emerging spacefaring nations. It's a very delicate name yeah. for this group of states. Um, some time ago, we uh, started a joint project with Bangladesh uh, for establishment of the first national satellite system for that country. For that project, we used Intersputnik's frequencies, but that was not the whole thing which was done. Of course, there were a kind of a training seminars for Bangladeshi uh, specialists and uh, later on uh, Bangladesh also filed their own satellite networks and there will be a process of uh, merging the satellite networks. In uh, 2018 I guess uh, the, the, the first Bangladesh satellite was successfully launched so now Bangladesh has their national satellite system and uh, within several years they will kind of separate from mm -hmm. intrasputnik frequencies and our fly filings and our system and uh, will be a good example of an uh, emerged space faring nation. So I would say that this kind of capacity building endeavors, be it trainings or uh, like annual seminar. Some time ago, we launched uh, an annual seminar about the national satellite communications and different uh, uh, aspects of uh, space communications for our member states. Uh, so this would be, I think, the major assistance uh, for those states who are willing to join uh, Space Club. Okay. Oh, interesting. So, and, and, and now I'm picking this or taking this question from Franco or into the, the next one I have. So let's talk about really 
some practical stuff. So how does Intersputnik coordinate its work with, with other operators on the GU or the uh, GSO? And Franco's um, question um, goes, goes into that. Why uh, does Intersputnik share policy options with ASOAR, Utilsat, or IGOs? And uh, is Intersputnik involved in the C-band satellite terrestrial ITU debate? So maybe you can frame that all into this one question. Okay. So with regard to cooperation with other uh, satellite operators, uh, we do it like any uh, other operator. I mean, there is a clear process uh, with regard to filing frequencies, mm -hmm. to um, um, performing international frequency coordination. So uh, we are quite active in this field of cooperation. We have some uh, 50, I think, satellite networks, including in the GSO and uh, a couple of non-gestationary satellite orbit networks. And um, of course, we have lots of coordination agreements. Uh, basically, it means that we have to agree upon different technical parameters with other administrations and satellite operators. Um, with regard to sharing policy or whatever, I would say that uh, we have cooperation agreements with uh, each of the other three organizations like International Telecommunication Satellite Organization, uh, Mobile Satellite Organization and UTELSAT, but you know it is more about uh, strategical cooperation, sure. being observer to uh, general assemblies or board meetings if uh, we talk about uh, interest Sputnik. Uh, we usually have a kind of a uh, meeting for the group of four uh, during international fora, like for instance, plenipotentiary conference uh, at the uh, ITU uh, platform or something else. But once again, if we talk about cooperation between IGOs, it's more a political thing, just okay. providing information and receiving information uh, from them. So. Probably there was another uh, the, question. Yeah, absolutely, there, there was a question about the C-band or satellite ah, yes. or terrestrial or debate. So, um, but uh, I assume that you, you have to be involved in that as well. Or... We are uh, involved not directly, but indirectly, I would say, because we have um, uh, some partners from these uh, different blocks like ABS, uh, Utilsat, and those countries, uh, or those organizations, uh, which names we can read on the media when the C-band issue is explained. Mm -hmm. Uh, with regard to Intersputnik, we are not involved in any uh, alliances with regard to C-band. More so, you know that every each state can uh, establish their own policy with regard to mm -hmm. spectrum. And uh, I believe that, for instance, in Russia, we will be having a different story about uh, C-band sharing. It is not uh, an option for Russia to just uh, give away these frequencies to mobile operators because we have uh, federal television uh, using C-band and it would be absolutely impossible uh, to just uh, give away all the C-band. So we are not engaged in this issue directly, happily, I think. Maybe it's a good time to think about digitization and getting away from 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 c band with this terrestrial broadcasting just saying that's but it's just my personal opinion um good um let's talk f some some further current topics or what are your thoughts as an igo of course are um, about space traffic management and i'm just picking this question from roger uh, that came in our, um, he goes further, weather satellites, planetary defense, lunar or Mars colonization, orbital debris management. I mean, I would frame that all under the, the space traffic management or item knowing that it's not precise. Huh? Okay. Um, well, Chris, it is a little overestimation of intersputing scope of business if we talk about planetary defense and so on and so forth. With regards to space traffic management, I would say that our experience 
is more related to being a satellite operator, uh, not as an IGO, because um, usually if an IGO serves a platform for promoting certain interests of an alliance, it should be an agreed decision of the member states. We do not have um, any such activity as uh, to drafting different um, papers on how space traffic management uh, would be. But uh, our experience as an operator of um, uh, frequencies at least. Um, last year, at the end of last year, it was for the first time in um, our uh, business practice when uh, a satellite which is operated by our partner and is located in an Sputnik's orbital slot was being approached by a third party satellite. Mm -hmm. And of course, there was a, a little inconvenience with this situation. And the situation was even more delicate because this third-party satellite was a Russian military satellite. And it, it was unclear how to solve this situation. So we wrote a letter to Roscosmos. Um, it, it is, of course, clear that Roscosmos itself is not responsible for military satellites, but uh, it might uh, forward this information to military of defense, uh, Minister of Defense, or uh, whatever entity is in charge. Uh, since we have not uh, received any response yet, so this story is far from over, uh, but the uh, conclusion uh, which we have made of this situation is that the lack of any rules with regard to space traffic man management, with regard to what is responsible behavior uh, or what is expected behavior, made this situation a bit inconvenient. Uh, and I think that a, a clear regulation or a kind of guidelines uh, would be very useful because now operators solve these uh, issues or matters on bilateral or multilateral basis. And it, of course, uh, when you operate in this field, it becomes clear how to handle this business, but with more private entities and newcomers uh, to uh, perform space activities, it can, be, it, it, it can be a kind of a little mess, I think. Well, thank you very much. And thank you very much for this wonderful bridge that you built for me, because um, I, I just can say that next week at the same time, uh, I have the uh, pleasure to talk with Dr. Jessica West from PlugShare Project in, in Canada. And we will talk about norms and behaviors in, in, in space and where we stand on that. And that goes exactly uh, what you just talked about. Um, what about jamming and cyber at, or attacks? Are that an issue for, for you as an organization or, or are you taking any actions in, the, in that field? Or, and then we are leaving the, the technical things. Uh, since we are not owners or manufacturers or operators of satellites, uh, there is no issue of vulnerability of spacecraft to us. So we buy service as it is uh, sold, for instance. Uh, but from a practical point of view, any uh, type of jamming to us is, a, is an example of harmful interference, which is uh, clearly forbidden by the ITU regime. And uh, for any type of uh, harmful interference, whether it is intentional, like jamming or unintentional, uh, happily, uh, most of uh, interference cases are unintentional. There is a clear procedure within the ITU which we follow uh, when such uh, questions arises. And uh, uh, in the bulk majority of cases, all these situations are settled quite uh, fast. But the problem might be connected uh, with how to um, find the source of um, uh, interference. Uh, because no uh, there is no technical uh, capacity which can 
uh -oh. identify the source of interference. And for this reason, you have to ask uh, somebody to uh, help with uh, geolocation. And this is exactly a new endeavor, which is taken by Intersputnik. We are inviting uh, operators to join in in the club of those who can geolocate uh, interference across the globe. So if you represent operators, please join in and we will make this issue easier for other. Wonderful. Um, I'm not sure if our audience uh... Got it. We had a, a short break, or at least on my end, we I'm, I experienced a short uh, inter interruption. I hope we are we are still okay with what we are saying. That our we are not taking off our off off, off air. Um, a question from Amanda Moore came in. Or um, does does Intersputnik have an online newsletter or to to subscribe? I I assume you you do have. I think we have a subscribe function on our website. We have uh, newsletters, but there are only two newsletters per uh, year. So it's like uh, even a small book, I would say. But we have uh, uh, the, the option to subscribe to some news. Uh, it can be found on our website. OK, wonderful, wonderful. Um, so. Let's talk about the future. What is the future of our intergovernmental organizations in space, or, I mean, in, in your case, such as, as Intersputnik? What can we expect? I mean, beside the, the huge celebration of the 50th anniversary and uh, France is, is joining. So. In the COVID era, I do not think that there is a celebration, but of course, uh, we would like to celebrate this event later this year, it will be in November. Uh, with respect to the future, it is very much useful that last week you had uh, Marco Ferrazani of ESA and uh, lots of things related to IGOs uh, in space business were already covered. Uh, I would say that for such organizations like ESA, the future is uh, more or less clear and uh, brilliant uh, because uh, such kind of organization do a lot for their member states. They contribute to different space programs. And as Marco said, space is too big for any uh, separate uh, nation. And that's why they have to pull resources to move forward. But I would say that on the other hand, there are organizations which clearly were established for very uh, specific purposes, like for instance, Intersputnik. It is clear now that uh, things went uh, not as it was planned. And that is why we have to somehow remain relevant to our member states to introduce new projects. I have uh, named several of them like seminars, like um, uh, this geolocation interference system. And also we launched several years ago a program to support uh, businesses in our member countries. It is called mm -hmm. Development uh, Program. Uh, once again, you can visit our website and read more about this program. We, uh, to boil it down, uh, we give free interest uh, loans to companies to be developed and uh, the amount of money which can be given uh, on the refundable basis, of course, uh, can be 1 million US dollars. By the way, this uh, process is open now until the end of February, we uh, wait for applications. So we have to evolve not to become dated for our member states. Mm -hmm. And I would say, there is a big difference with uh, other types of organizations like ESA. Yeah. Okay. Um, JV, we, we have seen your question. Or, um, I will or put you in contact direct with, with Elena to answer, to answer that. So let's take the last question or from, from Christian. So uh, which data are you using as a reference truth for your or space traffic management decision? Do you know that? Is it is it Wimpel or any any others or? It is NORAD. Okay. It's uh, North American uh, data. Yeah. Uh, 
I mean, provided by the US. It's free, uh, it's on the internet, and uh, I think it is accessible to everybody. And there are different software which can interpret this uh, US data into, um, I would say, user friendly modes. So we don't have uh, any um, um, intersputnik data collection system. We just rely on what is available, I would say, to everybody. Okay. Well, fair, fair point. So you're a believer also in the American truth of space <laughs> data. I, I just want to go I wouldn't into conclude into in such a way. I mean, we are, um, and I just want to point out, our, um, Christian and his colleague, uh, Valentin, wrote an excellent uh, piece last weekend, or we published it last weekend on, on spacewatch.global about uh, the situation that we are having at the moment in uh, low Earth orbit. And I think it's worth to uh, review that, and there will be a conclusion of this document in the up, on the upcoming weekend. But I think it's a good time now, as we are sitting here together um, with our wonderful our audience here, to make an announcement because you will be our host or the host, not our host, the host for our upcoming Space Cafe Russia. And uh, we are—I mean, I'm totally excited about that. Or that we are now can can talk also about or in a space cafe to people in Russia in Russian. So and with obviously a much better Russian than, than I ever spoke it. So tell us a bit about it. So who, who will be your first guest and what are we aiming for with this format, please? This is the right point. It is more important not who is the host, but who are guests. Um, yes, uh, thank you for this uh, uh, introduction. We will be having a very exceptional guest, I'm sure. She's uh, well known uh, across the globe and uh, to our audience today. Um, I mean, Dr. Olga Volinska. Uh, she has a very exceptional background. She used to work in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Russia, meaning that she um, uh, was preparing for legal subcommittees and um, uh, committees meetings. And um, uh, she also used to work in Roscosmos and um, accompanied uh, different international cooperation space projects. Now, uh, Olga is an independent international public law expert, and we very much look forward to uh, seeing her on the 5th of March uh, to talk about different... Isn't it the 5th? Yes, 5th of it's March. The 5th of March. So, sorry, I said the 6th. I was saying, no, it's the 5th. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Friday is the 5th. Friday, yes. Yeah. We will talk about great variety of uh, space law uh, questions. and. The reason uh, for this conversation to be in Russian, though many people would like to listen, it, uh, listen to it in, in, in English, is that we would like to deliver this space context to a wider uh, audience, uh, because uh, we started our conversation today with admitting that Space Wish Global is a very popular resource, but not everybody in this location uh, has uh, the needed command of English to be in the picture. So we would like to satisfy the interest of our local community. That's wonderful. No, that's that's great news and we are looking forward to that. And I mean, we are starting tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow, tomorrow evening, our, our time, uh, we will start with Brazil. And I see um, Mia in, in, the, in the audience are, who agreed to be the host of our Space Cafe Sweden. Uh, in, in in quite short time, so we will be there. Wonderful. If you like DPR of Korea, you know whom to ask. Space Voyage Global. I, I count on you. <laughs> I, I count on you. That's that will be interesting. Or uh, to to see my friend Kim there. So, okay. However, I'm afraid we have to come to to an end. Even so, I would uh, enjoy this conversation, and we will can or uh, we we can or uh, continue this conversation, but. For, for the time to keep our 33 minute format. But rest assured, we will continue. I mean, the topics you, you mentioned, and especially the space law topics, as you know, it's close to our heart, it's close to the Space Cafe web talks and our magazine. Again, for you in the audience, uh, we will start a Clubhouse lounge in a few minutes. So 
for those that like to talk to us or in a more uh, open uh, environment and we can provide it here. Just search for Space Cafe at 4.45 CET today um, on, on, on Clubhouse. And yeah, let's experiment with this new platform. So we have some interesting people there. And no, and yes, we know it's just for iPhones and, and so on. It's by invitation only. However, we will go there. Um, good, our, our next events are just a quick uh, run down on that. Uh, tomorrow, as mentioned, we will launch Space Cafe Brazil with uh, Ian Grossner in Brazil, in Portuguese. Um, and his guest will be the, really the, the wonderful Olavo Bittencourt. Uh, and yes, he's also a space lawyer, of, as, as we know him. Uh, on Thursday, on the 11th, we have the third episode of Moriba's Vox Populi, and he will talk with his outstanding selection of, of, of guests about space and religion. And he has representatives from all the major religions or that you can think of. And that will be an interesting experience. So it's uh, 4 p.m. are on Thursday European time zone. And on Monday, the 15th, we will continue our local space cafes or with the Space Cafe UAE by Abdallah Abu Wazel. And his first guest will be the absolute well-known Talal uh, Kaisi, and this space cafe will be in Arabic, Arabic English. We, we, we will see, uh, um, but also we will hear potentially an, an, an update or on the on the Hope mission. And even Talal is not engaged with the agency anymore, but are very well connected. And then, as mentioned earlier, next Tuesday, or uh, I will talk with Dr. Jessica West from the Plakshia project and then one week later I will talk with Nikolai Christoph from the World Economics Forum, the lead for, for space and many many other um, space cafes are on our planning uh, right now. All events are going are, are online on Eventbrite as usual. As always we would like to hear your feedback so please check in with us on Twitter on Facebook and on LinkedIn, we get really great comments about potential new guests and our new ideas. So feel free to, to send them over. Um, don't forget to sign up to our daily and our bi-weekly newsletters. And if you treat yourself with something special, or if you like to treat you, you with something special, become a, ah, I'm too small today, Space Watcher today. Um, your support will help us. So take your credit card and visit our fan shop at shop.spacewatch.global as written here also in the chat. I know that I repeat myself, but we need your support to continue our work. Thank you very much for all your interest today. And thank you, Elena, for thank your you. inspiring talk and bringing us really some knowledge about Intersputnik because I I'm so long in the industry and I had really limited knowledge about it. So it was was was, was great and, and for me very informative. Uh, very grateful for that. The pleasure um, was and, mine, thank you. And before you all uh, you in the audience say, hey, or can he learn from it? Yeah, that's the reason that I invite all these wonderful guests to learn from them because I'm the, the biggest fan of this show here, uh, so to say, uh, because I learned so much and have this quality time with all these wonderful people. But also I want to extend my thanks to the entire team behind the scenes for doing their great job week by week again. And I hope you all would stay safe and stay healthy. And thanks for joining us again. I hope to see you next week. In the meantime, or actually I want to see you in the next days. In the meantime, visit us on our website or follow us on social media. Don't forget, become the Space Watcher. Thank you very much. See you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.